join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we are so grateful for the power of the gospel. And Lord, when we get a glimpse of the depths of your love for us, that there are no words. And so, Lord, we pray today that as we open your scripture, as we peer into the depths of your love for us, that this glimpse of the good news would settle deep in our hearts and we would respond in faith. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it was good to be on vacation last week. Uh, Pastor Ezekiel, I am uh, praying that today in this moment you are experiencing a little bit of what I felt last week. I don't think pastors always realize how much we need to occasionally worship the Lord without being in charge, Uh, but we need that sometimes. And uh, I think Pastor Ezekiel, when he was coming here, said something like, I'll read scripture, I'll do anything, but please don't make me preach. Uh, You know, we, we need a day off on occasion. And I want you to know it was good for my soul to sit in a worship service last week where I didn't have to worry about anything going wrong or microphones not working. And uh, that was good for my heart. And it was, uh, I'm grateful to Pastor Jeff for filling in. That also helped me be at ease because I knew everything would be good here. Uh, but it's good to be back with you today. Allison and I got to spend a few days uh, just together. That's always good for a husband and wife. And one of the things we did was watch a movie that Netflix had been advertising at us, The Adam Project. Some of you may have seen it. It's a new uh, sci-fi movie with Ryan Reynolds. It's a time-traveling uh, movie. He is a pilot, a time-traveling pilot for 20, from 2050 who accidentally comes back to 2022 and has to buddy up with his 12-year-old self in order to you know, save the world. And it was a cute little movie. What we noticed though throughout it was how many references it had to other movies. I said, this looks like a a scene from Star Wars. And in another moment, this looks like a scene from E.T. And before long, we're Googling it because we just thought this seems overkill almost, that every scene seems to be related to some other scene in some other movie. And sure enough, that was kind of one of the conceits of the whole movie of all the different ways it paid tribute, especially to sci-fi movies from the 80s, which is when I was a kid. And so those are my favorite movies, right? And we made me think about a little bit about Easter eggs. That's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. If you are a guest, our sermon series is really drawn from this idea from modern movies and video games where the makers of those things will put in what have become called Easter eggs. That is little glimpses of of things that remind you of other movies. Now, the kind of Easter egg found in the Adam Project are the easiest kind of Easter eggs. Those are the Easter eggs that look back at things that have already happened. There's a far more really impressive kind of Easter egg in a movie when a company is, has enough forethought to really place in an Easter egg in this present movie about a movie to come. They have to have a lot of faith if they're going to do that, that that movie will eventually get made. The king of this kind of Easter egg is really the movie studio Pixar. If you go watch almost any Pixar movie, it will have Easter eggs of movies they haven't even let the public know are coming out from the very beginning in Monsters, Inc., which I think came out somewhere around 2001. Let that sink in for you. Makes you feel a little old, doesn't it? Uh, They had several places where you could see a little clownfish that you really wouldn't even know what it was until two years later when they released Finding Nemo. That takes a lot of forethought from someone. Of course, even that's nothing compared to what we have in our text today, Isaiah 52 and 53. Uh, Here, these are Easter eggs, that is prophecies in biblical language, telling of what is to come. And Isaiah writes not a few years before the coming of Jesus, but if we take Isaiah as a whole uh, from the prophet Isaiah who lived in the eighth century BCE, Or if you pay attention to biblical scholarship, some of you may say, well, isn't the second half of Isaiah, don't some scholars think that was uh, written later by the students of Isaiah? Even if you agree to that way of thinking, that is still over 500 years before the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet when we read the prophecy in Isaiah 52, 53, 
you can't help but see the one who is to come, the Savior of the world. We're going to read a lot of verses today, so stick with me. If anything, if my bat sermon is bad, we still will have left having heard God's word, and that is never a bad thing. So Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 53, 12. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. Amen. Looking backward at this passage, it, it to us, we, we read this passage and we really cannot, I mean, it just seems so obvious to us that this passage is about Jesus. It talks about the fact that though God, Jesus was God in the flesh, he came as an ordinary man, that there wasn't anything about his appearance that made him stand out. You know, in kind of all of our art, we, we often make Jesus with a, a halo glowing about him, but that's not how Jesus lived. He, he, he walked the earth and people saw him walk by and there was nothing that struck him, uh, struck those who knew him out of the ordinary. His appearance was not remarkable. And, and then this tells us really the story of his passion, that though he committed no violence, he, he wasn't a, a rebel in the classic sense of that word. They, they tried him as, as, a, as a criminal. And even though that trial and sentencing was unjust, even by the standards of his day, he put up no protest. He remained silent. If you're new to the Bible and, and you don't necessarily know what all these connections are, I encourage you uh, later today or later this week to uh, take Isaiah 52 and 53, the passage that we read, and then go look at the passage uh, that, that Pastor Ezekiel and, and Pastor John read earlier and expanded and just see all of the different places where this passage mirrors and anticipates what Jesus went through when he died on the cross. While it's easy for us to see the similarities looking back, 
I doubt that those in Isaiah's day and even the disciples who watched the crucifixion really understood what it was that Isaiah was foretelling. I think the primary reason for that is simply Isaiah was giving a a picture that was foreboding, a a picture that was negative. There were other prophets who spoke about the Messiah, but when they spoke about the Messiah, they almost always spoke about it in terms of what this great deliverer would do, which is he would deliver God's people from oppression and slavery. He would do that through a great victory. And, And Isaiah has those words. He concludes in verse 12 that God will give him, that is the Messiah, a portion among the great. But Isaiah in this prophecy makes clear what other prophets often leave veiled, that this great victory will actually come on the other side of great suffering that the Messiah won't bring about victory in the ordinary way by wiping out God's enemies, but instead the Messiah will come and really take on our transgressions, that is our sinfulness, that he will take on the evil of the world on himself so that we might be saved. Verse 12 gives the reason for the Messiah's exaltation by God in the starkest of terms. God will give him a great victory because He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. A suffering Messiah was not what anyone was looking for in Isaiah's day. And it was certainly not what they were looking for in Jesus's day. Even though this prophecy had been there for 500 years or 800 years, depending on which line of scholarship you follow, that even though it had been there that long, the people really hadn't got the message. And we can understand that too, can't we? When we hear a message from God that has both good news and bad news, our tendency is to listen to the good news and take everything we like about it and leave the rest. They had taken the good news that God was going to rescue them, but really had let fall to the wayside the means that God would bring about this salvation. So that it really required the death and the resurrection of Jesus and actually the instruction of the risen Lord to his disciples for them to understand. Isaiah's words were giving the picture of what Jesus had to endure for our behalf. Do you remember the story in Luke 24? It's Easter Sunday and some disciples are leaving Jerusalem. They're going back home to Emmaus, the place where they're from. Uh, They've kind of given up on everything and all of the the wildness of the weekend, Jesus' arrest and his suffering and his death on the cross. And they even say the rumors of the resurrection. They they decided we've just, we've had enough. We're gonna go home. And on the way, a stranger joins them. We know as readers that this stranger is Jesus, but Jesus doesn't reveal himself to them right away. And he he asked them what it is they're talking about. And they they are dumbfounded. They're like, have you not heard all that's going on? It's all people are talking about. And they they tell Jesus about his own suffering and his own death. And they say, and, and there's some strange rumors going about that some of the women are talking about that he has been raised from the dead. And Jesus, still not revealing his identity to them, says to them, how foolish are you? And how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Luke adds, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Can you imagine that Bible study? You know, after Alice and I watched that movie and we figured out there were all those Easter eggs, we went and Googled Easter eggs in the Adam Project and all these articles came up that, you know, try to detail each reference and and there were lots and lots of references and that was interesting, but nothing compared to what the disciples got on that day. That here Jesus started with Moses and went all the way through the prophets and showed each and every place that pointed to him so that they might understand. Notice what he says, why he had to suffer such things. It it isn't that he's just connecting the prophecies so that he can say, see uh, what the prophet said was true and so we should trust in them. That's part of it. But it's not simply that, that the prophets prophesied something and they came true. It's that he's trying to help them understand why it is that he had to suffer in order to bring about our salvation. 
That really is one of the great questions that people still have about the good news of Jesus Christ. To this very day, people still ask and question, why is it that Jesus had to die and suffer in order to bring about our salvation? Uh, An Australian author and apologist, John Dixon, was once speaking to a collegiate crowd. And he was talking about the wounds of God, this, this idea in Christianity that's really unique to Christianity that God has suffered on our behalf. And, and in that discussion, a, a Muslim man got up during the Q&A session and really with, with, with respect and civility that still challenged this idea that God, and he really spoke almost like a Greek philosopher calling him the cause of all causes. The idea that that great, uh, that, that great creator could suffer, that, that creatures who are less than God could cause God to suffer is really anathema to many other ways of thinking in the world, whether a Muslim concept of God or really a lot of the the Greek philosophers, not who believed in in, in the pantheon of gods, but who thought of God as this great unmoved uh, mover. Uh, The the idea that that God could somehow suffer, they thought was really uh, uh, something uh, almost blasphemous to say about God. And John Dickinson encountering this man, you know, he really didn't have any kind of quip to come back with him. He, he basically, uh, at the end of the day, just said, oh, you've done a great job of explaining the differences in our view of God. What is blasphemous to the Muslim concept of God is dear to the Christian's heart. That is this idea that the God who made us, that the God who is above all things, that the God who is all powerful would condescend and become one of us and not just become one of us, but become obedient to death, suffering on our behalf. This is the heart of the gospel. And it is scandalous, but here's what it is. It is the scandal of God's love. Why did Jesus have to suffer? Well, why do you and I many times have to suffer? We suffer because of love. C.S. Lewis once famously said, if if you don't want to experience pain and suffering, don't love anyone, right? I mean, to love anyone at all is to open oneself up to vulnerability. Uh, Perry and Saber, Perry over here, are celebrating their 50th anniversary today. And and I was talking to Perry before and saying, congratulations. And he said, can you believe she's put up with me for 50 years, right? Here's what's the truth in that statement, that, that love fills us with joy. Love is one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given us. But if you love sinful people, you will suffer. I guarantee it. That, that there's suffering that only happens because we love. Uh, any parent who has ever cared for a child through illness knows there's a kind of suffering that occurs only because we love. That, that if we love, if we're going to be with those we love in their own suffering, we too will suffer with them. There's no other way around that. And so if, if we're going to say that God loves us and that we know that we are sinful people, and that we know that we are people who suffer, if God is actually going to join us in relationship, then without a doubt for him to do that, he has to suffer alongside us. He he cannot actually enter into our lives, which are lives filled with suffering, filled with suffering. If we were ever to lay out each week all the sufferings of our hearts, friends, we, we would never leave. That, that our suffering is in many ways, uh, it, we, we cannot tally it up and God joins each one of us where we are. God is going to enter our world so that we might know him and be relationship, in, in relationship with him, then he's going to have to suffer. And Jesus, he does this on our behalf. But it isn't just that he joins us in our suffering that in suffering with us, the the only one who doesn't actually deserve to suffer because he is innocent and pure and holy, he exposes our sinfulness. Now that that sound, that doesn't sound very much like love to us because we live in a a culture that's constantly affirming, right? And and affirming each other is a good thing, uh, but it it can't all be affirming because we are sinners, right? I, I can't I can't ask the children's choir if my goatee looks good and, and just expect them to not give an honest answer if I want an honest answer. Like, right, if we, if we want in life to be more than our sinfulness, 
if we want in our life to, to be better in any sort of way. Yes, we want to be affirmed for what we do well, but also friends, it's required, love requires it, that truth be spoken over evil, that truth be spoken over the ways we fall short. Otherwise, love is allowing the evil to perpetuate in our lives, that evil must be called evil if good is going to be called good. And in the death of Jesus Christ, in his suffering, the one who did not deserve to die in such a way, he exposes the sinfulness of our world and the brokenness of our ways. You say, how so? Well, well here's what I know about the Jews of Jesus' day and the Romans of Jesus' day because I know about the people of our day, we all know that there is sin and brokenness in the world. I, I mean, that's just, uh, that's just one of the doctrines of the Bible that you just, it's the easiest to get evidence for, isn't it? Just look around. The world is broken. But in our brokenness, what we tend to do is think the brokenness is really rooted somewhere else. We, we think the brokenness of the world is somebody else's fault. And so the Jews of Jesus' day thought the brokenness of the world was whose fault? The Romans. And they sat around and just dreamed. If we could just get rid of the Romans, this world would be all that it's supposed to be. And of course, the Romans, they were in charge. So they, they you know, they, they didn't necessarily have one group that they thought were the troublemakers, but they thought all these other people are troublemakers and if we can just control them. Then the world will be as we want it to be. And we can think this too. Maybe you think the world is, you know, uh, maybe you think it's the fault of, of, of the Democrats, or maybe you think it's the fault of the Republicans, or maybe you think it's the fault uh, of the old people, or the fault of the young people. Or we've all got somebody that we think, you know, the world is evil, and how do I have proof? Those people right over there, just look at them. And here, here's, here's something, you're right, you're right that evil is found in those people over there. But in our own sinfulness, our own blindness, what we don't realize is that even if we got rid of all of those people, we wouldn't have gotten rid of evil because evil also resides in our own hearts, right? And so what Jesus comes, he's the only innocent, the only pure, the only holy one who has ever lived. And, and, and he lives in a world where the Romans are trying to blame things on one group of people. The Jewish leaders are trying to blame something on everybody else. And, and his death in many ways exposes where all of our ways lead. That all of our ways lead to injustice that all of our ways lead to us trying to preserve really our own power, our own resources at the expense of others. This is who we are as sinful people and there's not a group on the planet that has a monopoly on that kind of sin. And Jesus' death exposes really the, the sinfulness of our own hearts. And friends, when Alicia was singing just a moment ago about, about really the, the grace of God made manifest in the death of Jesus, what happens when we get a glimpse of that, if we're paying attention, if we're listening through the Spirit, is, is not that we come away from those moments thinking, oh, you know, uh, the, we're not convicted of the sin in the world as if it's somehow exterior to us. What we're convicted of is the sin in the depths of our own hearts. And when we think about the innocent Savior dying on the cross, we hear the words of Isaiah, we all like sheep have gone astray. And each of us has turned to our own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah's image draws from Israel's sacrificial system, a system in which Really, there really was no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And to a modern person, that seems so weird to us. We think, why in the world would you have that system? But, but it was a constant reminder that sin matters. And you can't just wink it away. That, that, that if, there, if we have incurred a debt, that for that debt to be forgiven, it must cost somebody something. And we understand this in certain degrees. If I owe you $100 and you in your graciousness forgive me that $100, it's true that I don't have to pay you back, but that doesn't mean the money magically appears in your pocket, does it? No, it costs you something. It, namely, it costs you the $100. And what is true for financial debt is also true for moral debt. That if we owe someone something because we have sinned against them, for them to forgive us 
cost them something. It cost them the, the right to get back. It cost them the right to, to you know, uh, hold us accountable. It, we feel this in our souls when we forgive someone who has wronged us, don't we? That, that we must bear the offense if we are going to forgive them. But what must be required to bear the offenses of the entire world? Isaiah gives us a picture of one who was crushed for our iniquities, who bore our sins so that by his wounds we might be healed. God in his graciousness does forgive us, but not because he winks away our sins, as if that could be done, but because he takes our sins upon himself so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. This is the gospel message. And we can sit around all day and discuss atonement theories and how the mechanics of this work. And I got all sorts of books that talk about that. And if you wanna do that, we can have coffee and we can talk about those things all day long. But friends, here's what I've never, uh, what I've noticed at least in my life, I've never been reading a book about atonement theory that made me leave having experience of God's presence. But when I read Isaiah, I do. When I read the picture that Isaiah gives us of the one who died for us, do I understand all the theories about it? No, but I believe it with all my heart because I've learned in this life that if we're going to forgive someone, it costs somebody something. And if we're going to fill, forgive the whole world, it costs God all he has to give. And that's exactly what he has done for us. And what's required of you and me? But to see and believe. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, there is no power greater than the power of the gospel. And it is a power made manifest in weakness and self-sacrifice. It exposes the sinfulness of our own hearts that are always grasping for power and security and safety, and yet you did the exact opposite. You who had all power, you who had all might, you laid that aside on our behalf becoming so vulnerable and weak in your love that we put you to death for it. But what we meant for evil, you have used for good, the very salvation of our souls. And Lord, it's my prayer today that if there is someone here who've never responded to that great gift, they wouldn't leave here today without looking at you upon the cross and believing that there on that cross is where we are saved. Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in ways that only your spirit can move. Lord, our, our words fall short. Our songs fall short. Our offerings fall short. But the word of God speaks to our souls and it draws us to you. And I pray today it would do just that. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen.